So, Joe, do you know what the word four means in Greek? <laughs> it means 40. <laughs> Church means the gathering of God's people. The Greek word for that is ekklesia, which means God's people, the gathering of God's people. We're, we're the church. Yeah, uh, you can't really go to church because we're the church. We go to the building to be the church. <laughs> so I want to invite you to turn to Revelation, last book in your Bible, Revelation chapter 2. And I want to talk to you about the church of Smyrna and then the church of Pergamum. Okay, Revelation chapter 2. And we're going to start in verse 8. And I'm just going to read through those and then we'll go back. And I think probably more teaching this morning than preaching, but we'll see. Revelation 2 and verse 8. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna, right? You know, the angel, the word angel means messenger, okay? So, and, and I think pastors are angels, actually. <laughs> no, but messenger is what it means. To the messenger of the church of Smyrna, right? These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. So we know who's speaking now, Jesus. In verse 9, I know your works. You know, that's a really neat thing about God. He knows what we're doing. He knows the things we do behind the scenes. He knows the things that nobody else gets to see but Him. And He will reward us accordingly. He says, I know your works and your tribulation and your poverty. But you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews, but they are not. They are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which you will suffer. Behold, the devil will cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you may have tribulation ten days. But be faithful unto death. I will give you a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He that overcomes will not be heard of the second death. And then to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things saith he, which hath a sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is, and that you hold fast to my name. You have not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you hold there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. So you also have those there that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in that stone a new name written, which no man knows except he who receives it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I pray today, Father God, that you will help me to articulate the message that you put into your word to two strikingly different churches. Uh, Lord, the, the, church of, uh, the church of Smyrna, which is the only church you did not rebuke in Revelation 2 and 3, and then the church of Pergamos, who you did rebuke twice. Help us, Lord, as we study your word. I pray you'll bless us today 
and give us instruction as you always do. For you are our teacher. We bless you in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit. All God's people said, Amen. 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 Holy Spirit's our teacher. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2 that we have no man that should teach us, but the Holy Ghost, which is in us, will guide us into all truth. Amen. And he will guide us into all truth. So the church of Smyrna was located on a small peninsula connected to the mainland of modern-day Turkey. Okay? And it's a narrow isthmus at the northeastern corner of the inner gulf of Izmir in modern-day Turkey. And this church has Hellenistic influence, which is Greek influence. Okay? Um, I heard my relatives talk, and they still can't let it go. It's been 1,500 years. Uh, <laughs> I'm just saying uh, how the Turks invaded Greece and had them in captivity for 500 years. And uh, it's probably time to let it go. You know, <laughs> time to let it go. Uh, but this church had the Greek influence, and it was the only church out of seven that was not rebuked by the Lord. All seven of those churches are found in modern-day Turkey. And then as we read the book of uh, Revelation, we understand that John was exiled to Patmos, which is right off the coast. It would be to the west of Turkey, just right off the coast of those seven churches. Uh, they took the apostle John and tried to kill him. Uh, tradition has it that they boiled him in oil. And when he came out of the oil, he wasn't dead. And uh, so they exiled him. God made him so angry that John didn't die, but they exiled him to Patmos, and that's where all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. John got this great spiritual teaching from the Lord in the spirit in heaven about what's going to happen in the future. So uh, in verse 8, uh, and let's turn back there to Revelation chapter 2, and verse 8, I'm going to put my marker there so I don't lose it. We need to know who is speaking. So in Revelation 2, 8, unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, these things saith the first and the last, the one who was dead and is now alive. So we're, Jesus is the authority here. In verse 9, it makes it pretty clear that this church was being persecuted. In the, in, in the midst of them were false brethren, and they were experiencing great troubles. They were poor in this world's goods, but Jesus said they were rich. They were rich in the things of God. So I want to ask, what can we learn from this church? What can we learn from this church that was poor in worldly goods, but very rich in the things of the Lord? And you know, I find when I speak with missionaries from Africa, I've uh, had a couple in my home from India, one from Israel, that it seems to me that the more people are poor in this world's goods, the more rich they are in their faith. It's really interesting. But um, if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew the 5th chapter, and we're going to look at verses 10 through 12. Matthew chapter 5, starting with verse 10, says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you know, if you watch the news at all, or you see uh, kind of the way uh, our country is going, Christians aren't real popular anymore. It seems like we're being called bigoted, narrow-minded, et cetera, et cetera. And I always like to quote the verse that the Apostle Paul uh, wrote. He said, I preach not myself, but Christ Jesus the Lord, myself, your servant, for Jesus' sake. So we're not preaching ourselves. We're preaching the Lord Jesus. It's his word that we preach, and so if anyone gets offended, they're not offended at us. They're offended at the Lord Jesus. Verse 11 says, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so did they persecute the prophets which were before you. So we see that God has a blessing for those who are persecuted, and certainly this church in Smyrna was persecuted. Luke chapter 12, if you'll turn over to Luke, Matthew, Mark, and then Luke chapter 12. This is a lot of what we do on Wednesday nights. We study the scriptures. 
And I, I thought it would be a really uh, different thing for us to do this morning, just to study the Word. Uh, you know, there's, there's time for preaching, and praise God for that, but there's also time to study the Word to see what is it really mean, and what is, what, what is God really saying here. So in Luke chapter 12, starting with verse 15, Luke 12, 15 says, And he said unto them, Take heed, beware of covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. And unfortunately, in our country, uh, I see bumper stickers like this. He who dies with the most gold wins. And how much do I want? Just a little more. And things like that. And I'd like to put a bumper sticker on my car that says, he who dies with the most gold still dies. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> he doesn't win anything. He still dies. You know, it's... That story of that guy that went to heaven, he had a big suitcase with him. And, and St. Peter said, well, what are you doing with the suitcase? And he says, oh, I brought all my gold from earth. And he said, gold? And he said, yeah. And he goes, we've got plenty of gold up here. And he said, well, I brought my own. So he opens it up and looks in the bag and he goes, what did you do bring an asphalt up here? Because <laughs> God paves heaven with gold. We don't need gold. We need God. Verse 16, so he spoke a parable unto them and said, There was a ground of a certain rich man that brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? I have no room where to bestow all my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns, and I'll build greater ones. And there I will bestow all my fruits and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20 says, But God said unto him, You fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then who, whose shall those things be which you have provided? So is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You know, none of us has a guarantee on how long we'll live. The only guarantee we have is eternal life Amen. through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. But we don't know if we'll be here tomorrow. We really don't. And that was brought forth in the news. We have one of our brothers in the church, Brother Paco, just lost his cousin uh, due to a semi-truck running through an intersection. And two people lost their lives. And I thank God that your cousin knew the Lord. He goes to my friend Paul Erickson's church and loved the Lord. Amen. So praise God that he is in heaven. But we never know. Right. We don't know. The Bible says in Proverbs 27.1, Boast not yourself of tomorrow, for a man does not know what a day will bring forth. We just don't know. Yeah. Friday I uh, was uh, just relaxing, and I got a call. My good friend Dana that comes to our men's Bible study uh, had a massive heart problem. And so I grabbed one of my buddies that goes to the uh, uh, Bible study with me, uh, Pastor Rick, and we went up to San Luis Obispo to French Hospital and visited him. Uh, the doctor said he had three arteries blocked that go to his heart. One of them was a widowmaker. He called it a widowmaker. I said, what does that mean? He said, that means that that could have killed him. And it's just, we don't know. We do not know what a day will bring forth. But we do know that we are rich in Christ if we put our trust in him and accept him as our Lord and Savior. We have eternal life. So Jesus promises victory, doesn't he? In verse 10, he promises victory. He said, I'll give you a crown of life. In verse uh, Luke chapter 12, if you're still there, verses 4 and 5 says, and I say unto you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who can kill your body. And after that, they have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. You are to fear him who, after he is killed, has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. That's the fear of the Lord. Right. Knowing what God could do and accepting and taking his grace now while you have a chance. Amen. Amen. Because the night is coming, but no man can work anymore. 
according to the scripture. So in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57 and 58, it's one of the verses that I prayed over uh, Pastor Gary and Helen and Sister Sandra Meshagan. Thanks be to God who's given us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then God says, so my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know, you may not get a lot of accolades down here on this earth. You just may not. But you'll definitely get them in heaven. You'll definitely hear your Savior say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You will hear your Savior say those words if you're faithful. And that's the only thing God asks us to be, is faithful. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2 says, Now it is accounted, brethren, as ministers of the mysteries of Christ. Moreover, it is required, verse 2 says, that a man be found faithful. Amen. And you know, uh, I can't attribute to any success in my life other than giving the glory to God. Amen. The only thing I can claim is I showed up. Amen. God did the rest. You know, we can show up. Uh, I've had a Bible study, and most of you know that, going on, a men's Bible study for 25 years in my home. And I give God the glory for that because I showed up on days that I didn't want to show up. There were plenty of days that I wanted to get on my Harley and ride into the sunset and let him knock on the door. Where is he? Where is he? And God wouldn't let me do it. And those were the days that I really felt the most blessing from the Lord. You know, it's easy when it's fun. But when it's a struggle, when it's a sacrifice, God says, be faithful. Be faithful because I have things set up for you that you know not of. The Bible says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Here on this earth and up in heaven, God's preparing things even for us now where he says in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans that I have for your life, says the Lord. They're good plans. They're not evil plans to give you a future and a hope. And God has plans for here, the kingdom of God here, and then the kingdom of God when we go up above. God has good plans for us. He's not done with us. I thank God for the ladies here in the front row. This is the cheerleading team here. Uh, <laughs> actually, front and second. Uh, they have, uh, where's your pom-poms? You got them there? <laughs> there they are. <laughs> I'm not even going to tell you the age of a couple of them, uh, three of them. I know their age, I'm not telling you. <laughs> but I am blessed and amazed how active they are Amen. at their age. Right. My prayer has always been, Lord, it'd be really cool if I could just open my eyes at that age. That would be, <laughs> that would be awesome. You know? Unbelievable how much energy God has given them and how much they serve the Lord and are joyful to do it. And that's a great example for us. And that helps me to keep going and saying, you know, in another 40 years when I get that old, uh, <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm exaggerating, it would be more like 20. <laughs> okay, let's go on. Verse 11. He tells him, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear with the Spirit. You know, when we pray on Monday nights here at 7 o'clock, I have learned to do that. And it took me a while to learn this. We have two of these right here and one of these. So I think my time should be divided by a third and then two thirds. One third telling God what I'd like to see happen or asking God what I'd like to see him do. And two thirds listening to what he has to say to me about that. For instance, if I say, oh Lord, I went by Macy's and I saw that $400 coat I really need that. And then I listen and he says, you don't get that $400 coat. You get a $39.95 coat of J.C. Penny. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta listen. It's a two-way conversation. We tell the Lord what's on our heart. He already knows anyway. We tell him what's on our heart and then we listen. We take time. We're very quiet and we listen to what the Lord has to say. God has a lot to say. He has a lot to say. I believe prayer should be two-thirds listening and one-third speaking. I really do. He said, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church.
church. And then he says, if you overcome, the second death has no power. So I, I kind of did a study on the second death. What? Okay, the first death. Uh-oh, I'm going to need an illustration here. Okay, here we go. Brother Joe? Papa? Oh, he's already getting up. All right, which one of you guys want to die? <laughs> <laughs> Let's let Joe die this time, okay? <laughs> I don't know, I forgot my part. <laughs> I'll stick that room. Okay, you're going to die again? Okay, all right. Don't worry about it. Here's what we look like. Okay. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. This is your prize. Okay, uh, we have a soul, and that's who I am. We have a spirit needs to be born again. And we have a body that we walk around in. So this is the way we walk around earth. <laughs> Soul, spirit, and body. When we get saved, our spirit becomes alive. Now all of a sudden, God decides, time for you to go home. Dwizzle, 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 dwizzle. Time for this one to go home. <laughs> and here we are. Nothing changed. We're, we're right into heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen? That's what happens. You leave your body and you go right into heaven to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't skip a beat. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So our body has to go away because flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we're all going to be changed. For in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, that's the dead bodies, and we will be changed. So our bodies are going to go through a change. The Bible says this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So that's when we'll be brought to pass the saying, death will be swallowed up in victory. So although our body may go into the ground, we'll never even know that because our spirit is with the Lord if we receive Jesus Christ Amen. as our Lord and Savior. Jesus said in John 3, 7, you must be born again. You must be born again. Your spirit has to be made alive through the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, forgive me, but it's not through any works that we do. Uh, Brother Clark quoted it this morning, Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to God's mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. The washing of regeneration is the blood of Jesus. That's what regenerates us, makes us alive, the blood of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit then comes in and makes our spirit alive. And that's what makes us alive, the blood of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Okay, Jesus rose from the dead, and he said, if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit won't come to you. So, but if I go, I will send him to you, and he will guide you into all truth and teach you all things, whatever he hears the Father say. That's found in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, the same verse. Uh, John 14, 26, 15, 26, and then chapter 16, 13. All the same teaching. Holy Spirit will teach us everything. So the second death is when our body dies, but our soul dies too. Because we haven't made our spirit alive through receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So the Bible puts it this way in John 3, 36. He that believes on Jesus has everlasting life. He that does not believe shall not see life, but the wrath of God will abide on him. So God says, unless you're born again, you can't enter into the kingdom of God. He told Nicodemus, a Jewish ruler, that. And then in John chapter 14, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father but by me. You've got all kinds of religions in the world, you know. Uh, if you make a little gold statue and you bring fruit and set it at it and put money and, and pay money to light candles and all this stuff. No. It's not by any works at all. 
It's not by taking communion. It's not by being baptized. It's not anything at all except nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Hebrews 9.22 says, and by the law, all things are purged with blood. And without the blood, there is no remission of sins. So you can do all the good works you think you want to do. But if you're not born again, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. Isaiah 64, 6 says this. We are all as an unclean thing. And all of our righteousnesses, all of our good works are like filthy rags to the Lord. It's only the righteousness of Jesus Christ that gains us entrance into heaven. And I think the enemy is really true. So the enemy can't get you to rob a bank or lie or steal or dishonor your parents. So he'll get you to go in on your own goodness. Oh, you're good enough. You've done 300 good things and only five bad things. Or he'll say, if you keep doing all these good things, then you'll go. And the fact of it is, no good thing will ever get you into heaven. Only the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to be so sure of that. Because there are so many false prophets in the world today. Matthew 24, 35 tells us that in the last days, many false prophets shall enter into the world. And they will deceive many. They will deceive many. And man, is that going on in some of the churches today? Uh, I, I hear and see these things on, on videos that are like, what in the world? What Bible are they reading? We've got to stay close to God. We've got to stay close to his word. We have to listen to the Holy Spirit. We have to pray. We have to be faithful. And we have to trust completely in him. Amen. He's the only one that's going to get us there. Amen. He is. Jude verse 24. There's only one chapter. So Jude in the 24th verse says, Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless with joy before his throne, unto him be all glory and praise and honor forever and ever. Amen. Amen. He's the only one that can keep us. Amen. The Bible says we are kept by the power of God through faith, ready to be revealed in the last time. Amen. We are kept by God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, that you're keeping us. So he that has an ear, let him hear. So the second death, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11, if you'll turn there with me. The second death is to be to die once in your body and then die once in your soul to be condemned to hell forever in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone, which is, the Bible says, the second death. Verse 11 says, uh, Revelation 12, verse 11, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives, even unto death. So we may lose our body, but we will never lose our soul. That's right. We're believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, that word believe in the scripture is the Greek word pistevo. And I've heard that word thousands of times as I was growing up from my Greek grandmother and grandfather. It doesn't mean believe up here. It means believe in here. Totally, completely rely upon is the definition of the Greek word pistevo. Totally, completely rely upon. I was in a grocery store when I first got saved. I offended lots of people. I just figured the whole world needed to get saved, and it was my job. So there was this lady standing in line, and, you know, I just, I don't know, I just kind of picked up that I should talk. And so uh, we were at Food for Less, so the line was long, and I had plenty of time. And I just I kind of tapped her on the shoulder, and I said, excuse me, ma'am. I said, do you know the, uh, the Lord as your Savior? And uh, she said, why do you ask? And I said, well, I, I see you're very modestly dressed here, and, you know, your, your children are well-behaved, and I kind of just figured you were probably a believer. And she said, absolutely. I've never cut my hair. And I wear very modest clothing. And she went on and on to make this whole list of how good she was. And I said, can you tell me when you were born again? And she just looked at me and kept going with this whole list of all these good things. She obeys her husband. She wears long dresses. She wears her hair up in a bun and never cut it and all this other stuff. And I just, I, I just pulled out a tract out of my hand. I said, uh, maybe someday if you get a chance, I'd like to invite you to our church. I give her a gospel tract that says this. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you believe that God raised him from the dead, and if you confess that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. For with your heart, you believe in it being good enough for God. In other words, with your heart, you believe in the righteousness. And then with your mouth, you confess unto salvation. Amen. And I just prayed and said, Lord God, help her to read that scripture. Help her to understand, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to God's mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration Amen. and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Man, people are... You know, the enemy's tricky, man. If he can't get you one way, he'll get you into some religion that will keep you in bondage. So he goes on to say in Revelation 21, verses 4 through 7. Almost the last page of the book. Revelation 21, verse 4 through 7. When we get to heaven, you know that song, Don't Worry, Be Happy? <laughs> We will be singing something like that. <laughs> and God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. Everybody in this building has cried tears. We've all had sadness. We've all wept. All the tears are going to be wiped away. And there will be no more death. None will die. I mean, I believe we'll be able to pluck a flower and it'll still be living. You know, of course, the Lord may be upset with us for plucking flowers and probably going to leave where they are. But I really believe with all my heart, everything's going to be brand new, just like God says here. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more sorrow. Nothing to be sorrowful about anymore. No more crying. Now, I remember when my mother passed away. I was 27 years old. I rode my Harley from California to Utah for the funeral. And... Uh, I had no clue. I wasn't a Christian. I had no clue what happened to my mom. All I remember is sitting in the Greek Orthodox Church, just bawling my eyes out. And my brother Stephen next to me, Stephen had gotten back. Uh, no, he'd been back from Vietnam a while. But uh, he was sitting right next to me, and he kept putting his arm around me, telling me, don't cry, don't cry. She's, she's, she's good. She's in a better place. She's in a better place. And I just wept, man. I just could not get over seeing my mom in a casket and not knowing will I ever see her again you know what will happen and it wasn't until the next year on November 4th of 1980 she died in 79 uh, that I, I got saved and then I started thinking about that funeral and I thought I'm pretty sure my brother told me that he was a Christian I didn't even know what that was. So I called him up after I got born again. He was going to some church that doesn't really preach the gospel. And I called him up and I said, hey, brother, how you doing? And he said, is this Greg? And I said, yeah. And he said, I'm good. I said, well, that's good, brother. And he says, well, what's going on? I said, not much, brother. What's up with you, brother? <laughs> He just said, so what's with the brother? <laughs> and I said, well, a few weeks ago, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I got born again. And it was silent on the other end. And I chewed him out for about a half an hour. How dare you sit next to me at my mom's funeral and not tell me about Jesus? How dare you sit there and say she's in a better place and you knew I had no clue of where she was at all. Man, I chewed him out. He got so convicted he quit that church. <laughs> he got into a full gospel church and really got on fire for the Lord. And he was saved. He got saved in Vietnam. But he got saved to sit, not saved to serve. And now he's serving. Actually, now he's an assistant pastor of that church in uh, uh, Spokane Valley, Washington. So, <laughs> Praise God for sharing the gospel. He that hath an ear to hear. God says, I will make all things new. He said, right for these words are true and faithful. Verse 5, verse 6, Revelation 21, 6. He said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to him who is thirsty of the fountain of water life free. He that overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God. He will be. 
Is that great news? Amen. Praise God. He praises this church in Smyrna. Then there was this other church, okay? And that's in uh, Revelation chapter 2, starting with verse 12. I want to give you a little history about the church of Pergamum. We learned about Smyrna right there in modern-day Turkey. So was Pergamos. But Smyrna was being persecuted. They were poor in the world's goods, but they were rich in faith. And, and, and the Lord promised them a blessing if they would just remain faithful. And then there's this church, the Church of Pergamos. The church was an ancient Greek city located near the modern-day city of, it's called Bergama, and it's in Turkey. The first letter, you remember, was written to Ephesus. That was the church... Uh, that left its first love. If you read Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, it's talking about the church of Ephesus. They left their first love. In other words, they were so excited about Jesus when they first got saved, and then they got settled down and, you know, took everything for granted and quit doing anything for the Lord. And the Lord rebuked them and told them, you know, you've left your first love. Get back to what you were doing. So I guess to me that means get back to offending people in the grocery store. Um, the first letter, uh, or the second letter, was written to Smyrna, and it was the persecuted churches as well. We, we talked about that. But this letter is written to a compromising church. This one's written to a church that compromises the gospel. Well, we don't want to upset anybody. We, we wouldn't want to offend anybody, would we? Well, I don't know. Why'd they want to kill Jesus? Because he made everybody happy? They, kill, they want to kill him and John and Peter and James and Bartholomew and Thaddeus and the rest of them because they preach the truth. In fact, the Apostle Paul was persecuted, and he said to the church in Galatia after he rebuked them and said, What happened to you guys? Who bewitched you that you wouldn't follow the truth? And then in chapter 4 he tells them, Am I therefore become your enemy because I've told you the truth? And that's what we have to ask. We don't want to make enemies, of course. But when we speak the truth, we will. Because there's a great divide now. It's either you're born again or you're not. The Lord is your Savior or he's not. And so this church is beginning to be linked inseparably to the world. And it's decided that it can maintain some kind of Christian credibility but also associates itself with all kinds of sin and all kinds of worldliness. You know, I'm not, I'm not talking about legalism or, you know, let's, let's everybody wear a suit and tie. I'm not talking about that. By the way, do you know where I, why I wear a suit and tie? Because God broke my heart one time, Joe. I was in a church, and, and I, uh, I thought I looked good. It was up in Avila Beach, and, and I had on a, a real nice dress shirt, and I think I, that day, that's when corduroys were in. Some of you may, might know what, not what that is. But, uh, so I had a nice pair of brown corduroy pants and shined up cowboy boots. And I thought I looked presentable. And so Gladys Misakian, who was a lady from Armenia, had been born again in our church. And she wanted to bring her friend, some other name I can't pronounce. So she brought her friend, and she was also Armenian. And she came into the church and was looking around and said, well, wow, Nice place. She said, where's the pastor? And Gladys said, oh, that's him right over there. She goes, well, he don't look like no pastor to me. And she turned around and walked away. The sad part of it was the next week she had a heart attack and died. And Gladys said, you know what? I brought her to church because she wasn't born again. And I tried talking to her about the Lord. And she insisted that her religion was good enough. Man, it broke my heart. And I thought, you know, Lord, where Paul said I become a, a Greek to the Greeks and a Roman to the Romans, so that by all means, by, so that by some, by all means, some people might be saved. That's the reason I do that. Is because people from the world come in and they expect to see what their picture is, you know, of, of a priest or a pastor or whatever. So I don't dress like this all the time. Uh, this is the only time I dress like this. Most of the time I wear black leather and I ride motorcycles with some of these guys in here. And we have a great time, you know. But I think when we're serving the Lord, whatever position we're in, we should approach people in that direction so that we don't offend them. And I realize some people are offended no matter what you do. 
you know, so I've got my other outfit in the side room, which is a big, long, black robe with the Greek Orthodox hat. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> but you know, I, I got to tell you another story. You're going to love this one. We shouldn't judge. But <laughs> God got me a good one on this one. So my Aunt Sophie, uh, she was my mom's sister. And she kind of became my mom after my mom passed away. So I talked to her all the time. And I really wanted to leave my Aunt Sophie to the Lord. And I'd, I'd call her and tell her about Scripture and She'd say, Greg, you don't have to tell me about this. I've been doing this since way before you were born. And on and on, I'd say, but Aunt Sophie, are you born again? Have you received Jesus, you know? And she'd tell me about taking the Eucharist and all these other things in the Greek Orthodox, which is fine. It's all fine. But you got to be born again. So my Aunt Sophie passed away uh, three or five years ago, something like that. I went to Utah to her funeral. So I go to the Greek Orthodox Church, and there's this guy standing up there, and I'm looking at him saying, he didn't look Greek to me. And he looks more like he's from England or something. What's he doing in the Greek Orthodox Church? So all of a sudden, the guy gets up, and he's the priest, and he preaches the gospel and tells all the people in the Greek Orthodox Church, it's only by the blood of Jesus. And I'm like, I'm floored. I've been to so many Greek Orthodox funerals. I mean, they hire professional whalers. You know, not, not ocean whalers, but people who cry. Okay? And, and they do. I mean, it's, it's a horrific experience when you go. There's a lot of weeping, and sometimes people try to jump in the casket. And it's really emotional. Very dramatic. Not like me. Very dramatic. <laughs> so, so anyway... So after he finishes his message, I'm like, dude, what happened to the Greek Orthodox Church? So I think what happened was my heart got open and I got born again and I started seeing things more clearly. But so afterwards, the people go up and they, they kiss the priest's hand, okay? Um, I prefer not to do that. I like to shake hands or hug. And I didn't think it would be appropriate to hug him. So I just reached out my hand and shook his hand and I said, that was one of the best funeral messages I've ever heard. And he said, who are you? And I said, I'm Sophie's nephew. And he said, oh, and I said, are you Greek? He said, no, I'm Irish. <laughs> I said, what are you doing in the Greek Orthodox Church? He goes, can I talk to you after? And I said, sure. So we went downstairs, all my relatives are down there, and. Uh, they're all, you know, eating and drinking and doing all of that. And so I'm sitting with the priest, and all my relatives are looking at me like, what, what's that about? You know? <laughs> and so I'm talking with him, and I said, so tell me your story. He said, I was an Assembly of God pastor, and God called me into the mission field. So I, my first mission was Greece. So I went to Greece. I fell in love with the people, in love with the customs. I fell in love with them, and I felt like the Lord said, you need to become a Greek Orthodox priest. He said, so I turned in my credentials for the Assembly of God, went through their ecumenical school, and became a Greek Orthodox priest. And I said, you speak Greek too? He said, yeah, yeah, I speak it too. And I said, so what are you doing, brother? And he said, I'm leading people to Jesus. What are you doing? <laughs> I said, tell me some of the people you've led to Jesus here. And he said, your Aunt Sophie. Praise God. He was having a Bible study in the Greek Orthodox Church leading people to Christ. What a mission. And I thought, Lord, please don't call me back to Price, Utah to be a priest. Because <laughs> I hate going to school. <laughs> but isn't that something? So the Christ is preached wherever you have an ear to hear. Amen. I've been to the Catholic Church and heard the gospel. Been to the Greek church, heard the gospel. I'm not saying everybody's saved there, just like maybe not everybody's saved here. That's right. We don't know. You just be coming to church, you're not a Christian. You become a Christian by receiving Jesus as Savior. Exactly. So God's talking to this church in modern day Pergamos, Turkey. The old name is Pergamos. So Pergamos is a picture of any church that courts the world. 
It's any church that marries paganism into their doctrine. The Church of Pergamos is a clear warning to any believer, any Christian who weds the world, like we'll see. First of all, Jesus tells him in verse 12, I'm the one who has the sharp sword with two edges. You know what he's telling them? Get back to the word. See, the Bible says in Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is alive. It's full of power. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing place of your soul and your spirit and of your joints and your marrow. And it is the understander or discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. So God's word will speak to you in any way you need to be spoken to. It doesn't matter what I preach on, as long as I'm preaching the word of God. If I'm preaching the word of God, God can speak to you about anything in your life. It doesn't have to be the same subject. Can I tell you another story? So my pastor, uh, I grew up in a family that they give. They give. You know, you, you're hungry? Come in and eat. You know, you, they give. And so I, I've never had a problem with giving. Uh, it's just the way I was raised. I had a hard time with receiving, but God broke my neck over that one, too. So I can receive now, and I like to give, too. So um, uh, my pastor was preaching on giving, and I just turned him off. I know you guys never do that to me, but I, I did that to him. I just turned him off. So I thought, I don't need to hear this. I'm already doing that. So I turned him off, and he's preaching, and I'm, I don't know what I was thinking about something. Anyway, when, when he gave the invitation, all of a sudden my heart was just on fire. I was so broken, and I, I ran up the aisle and fell down at the altar and started praying, and uh, other people did, and uh, the pastor came over to me and put his hand on my shoulder, and he goes, you okay? And I said, not really. And he said, brother, I know you're faithful, because in that church, uh, I don't do that here, and you can ask Marsha. I have no clue who gives what, and I don't care. That's between you and God. I could care less. I don't want to be prejudiced towards or against anyone. I just say, hey, it's none of my business. You know, it's like that Italian friend of mine. It's none of your business. <laughs> so, you know, my business is to preach the word. God's business is to keep his work going. Amen? Amen. So he said, well, what's going on? You know, I know you're a faithful giver. And I said, I have something in my garage that I forgot was there. And after I got saved, I locked my garage door and my chopper in there until I sold it. And I had all kinds of stuff on the wall. And I'm not going to describe it, but it wasn't good. And the Lord convicted me of those pictures that were on the wall in my garage while he was preaching on giving. And I suppose the correct scripture for that would be, God gives and God takes away. <laughs> Man, I went home and cleaned house, tore all that stuff up, put it in the fire pit, burned it all. But God can get you wherever you're at. It doesn't matter what you preach on. As long as you're preaching the word, God's word is alive. And so Jesus tells him in verse 12, I'm the one with the two-edged sword. I'm the, I'm the word. Get back to the word. And then verse 13, God knew that they lived where Satan seat dwells. In other words, Pergamos was a city where there was a lot of trade. There was a lot of different cultures there. There was paganism and Satanism and all kinds of craziness going on in their city. So they live in the seat where Jesus describes it as the seat where Satan lives. Okay, so there's all kinds of really bad stuff going on in that city. And then God puts this church right in the middle of it. He says, hey, I, I, know, I know where you are. And I know what you live, and I know what you face. But God tells them, you be faithful. So in Hebrews chapter 10, if you'll turn there with me, Hebrews 10, verses 23 through 25. And people will fight you over this. I won't. I just know what the word of the Lord says, and I try to obey it the best I can. I fail often, but I get back up and get back in the race. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For God is faithful who promised. So he says, hold fast to it. Don't, don't get lazy about it. Don't keep a loose grip. 
hold fast to it. Verse 24, and let us consider one another to provoke one another unto love and unto good works. That word provoke is pretty strong. It doesn't mean encourage. It means provoke. It means get under the skin in the Greek. It's a, it's a word that is the same word used to get under the skin, like when you get a, something under your fingernail or you get a thorn or something like that. It means you get your attention. So provoke one another to love and to good works. In verse 25, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhort one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching, and we see the day approaching. You know, church is kind of like a barbecue pit. There he goes. <laughs> you got all these coals in the barbecue pit. Pour that stuff on it, throw a match in there, and watch it go poof. And then it lights on fire, and pretty soon the fire goes down, and then all those coals turn white. <laughs> they all start getting really hot. But if you take one of those coals and you grab it and throw it on the, on the grass, in about four minutes, it, it turns dark again. It turns black again. And, and church to me is the same way. Fellowship. And I'm not, now when I say church, I don't mean the building. I mean gathering together of Christians. It's really the same way. If we stay together, we'll stay hot together. If we start getting out there, and boy, did I ever learn that as a young kid uh, on the sheep ranch at my grandpa home. You always had lambies because little lambs, you know, they're just born and they don't have any knowledge or any wisdom, so they just go running off. And usually their mom, the you sheep, goes and finds them and not you, but E-W-E, you, <laughs> goes and finds them and then tries to bring them back. Sometimes they get away. And me and my cousin Johnny used to find them sometimes down in the gully and they were just stiff as a board and some coyote got them. But that's kind of what happens if we don't stay together and encourage one another and provoke one another unto love and the good works. We start getting kind of wandering. And I've been there. Trust me, I have been there. And it's really hard to get back. So I want to encourage you to continue to love one another. You know, when I encourage people all the time, I have some people tell me, uh, a lot of people these days tell me, I don't like to go to church. I don't like the formality. I don't like the, the whole format. I just don't like it. And I tell them, well, then get into a good Bible study. Get into some place where you can hear the Word of God and have other Christian fellowship, because I know once you do that, you're going to want more. But do something. Don't just be a loner. Don't be out there. You know, and, and God has taught me some things, church, of, uh, you know, all kinds of things about not judging other believers. Uh, for instance, the missionaries in Africa, they don't have a church building. They're in the jungle. My good friend Michael Parsa, that we supported for two years in our men's Bible study, they didn't have a church building. He just would go out and sit in the jungle and talk with the people and tell them one by one about the Lord. And finally, a bunch of them got saved and then in Papua New Guinea. And then once they all got saved, then they gathered around and sat on the ground together and had church. You can have church anywhere. You can, hey, you know what? Me and Joe have church at Black Bear Diner. <laughs> Over a bear cloth, sorry, Mark, but we do. <laughs> anywhere two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst of you. And how many times have we been there and we've been able to minister or talk to someone or someone comes up to us and, you know, you got to put yourself out there. If you want God to connect people to you, God, be out there. Right. You know, that's why, and it was real funny when I first got appointed here, Marcia said, so what are your office hours? And I said, Sunday morning for 15 minutes. <laughs> she said, you got to be kidding me. I said, no, my office isn't down there. My office is out there. I made that mistake in Apple Beach. I sat in the building and acted all holy every day and studied my Bible, and I got in big trouble. So I learned to get out and go out into the field. Go, you know, that's what Jesus said. Go out to the field. The field is white with harvest. Pray the Lord's harvest that he would send laborers into the field. For the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. So that's where I'm at. You know, you can find me at Panera Bread, Starbucks, on the Harley, talking to people at the Harley shop, here, there, hospital, rest home. It's my job. It's, what I, it's my job for the Lord, not for this church. It's what I do because this is where God has placed me. 
And there's all kinds of people that we get to minister to that don't even come to this church. But they need a pastor. They need a shepherd. They need somebody to love on and encourage them in the Lord. And so church is wherever we meet together. It's where we meet. Amen. Verse 13, God knows where we are and what we face. Verse 14, turn with me to Romans chapter 14. We're talking about Revelation 2.14. It says, I have a few things against you, because you have had those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balaam to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, and to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. And verse 15 says, you also have those that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Well, you know when God says he hates something, you probably ought to pay attention. Yeah, that's a strong word. So verse 14, it, uh, we're looking at Romans chapter 14, verses 19 through 23. <laughs> so dumb. Why don't you just get a laptop so you don't have to turn all the pages? <coughs> I want my Bible as long as I can have it, because someday they're probably going to take them away. I want to hide it in my heart. I want to feel it. I want to touch it. Yeah. You know, I don't have a problem at home on a computer Bible thing. I can copy verses. But when I'm here, I, I want us to learn to read our Bible. Yeah. I've been to, you'll forgive me, but I've been to several churches in this town. They have, people don't carry Bibles in the church. It's like, what? Yeah. And when you go hunting, you carry a gun. <laughs> Shouldn't you carry a Bible when you go to church? You know, I'm not going to the woods without a gun. Bears think I'm lunch. <laughs> I'm soaked in olive oil. They like that. I'm not going to be there lunch. And so when we come to church, shouldn't we be prepared to see if those things are true? It amazes me where I've gone to some and they just have a big screen and a big screen and no Bibles. It's like, I'm not going to trust that guy. You know, and and then I hear him saying things, and it's like, where's that? We need to preach the word. Amen. We need to talk about Jesus. That's who gives us life. Romans 14, 19 through 23. Let us therefore follow after these things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another one. Because food doesn't destroy the work of God. All things are pure. But it's evil for the man who does it with, or who eats with offense. In other words, I'm good with ham sandwiches, but if I'm with my Jewish friends who are saved, I won't eat ham sandwich because it'll offend them. I go to places where people have a glass of wine, I won't have one. You know why? It's not because I, I want to be a Pharisee. It's because I believe that if someone walks up and sees me drinking alcohol, they're going to say, what a hypocrite. The guy's over here preaching at his church, and he's over here getting drunk. So I don't do it. You know, I'm not going to judge you for doing it. If you go to a barbecue and have a beer, that's between you and God. If you go to Germany, everybody drinks beer. All the Christians drink beer in Germany. And in South America, the believers drink wine down there. So we can't say, well, you're going to go to hell if you have a glass of wine. Fact of it is, I just don't know a lot of people that can handle their and I've had family members who've had to go to prison because they couldn't handle their alcohol. So I've seen the destruction that it can do, and man, I just like stay away from it. You know, I, I'm not going to judge you for it. You have to do what's right before God in, in what the Scripture says for you to do. The Bible says all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. So I can eat a ham sandwich. But if I'm with somebody that's going to stumble, I won't do it. I can eat lobster. But if I'm with somebody that says, oh, that's a bottom crawler, God says not to eat those things that crawl, crawl on the bottom, okay, fine, I won't eat it. I'll eat whatever they're having. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. It is good neither to eat flesh, verse 21, or drink wine, or do anything that stumbles your brother or offends him or makes him weak. Do you have faith? Well, have it to yourself before God. Happy is the person that does not condemn himself in the thing that he allows. Amen? Amen. Verse 23. He that doubts is judged if he eats. 
because he is not eating of faith. Because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So if you don't have peace about it, don't do it. Just, if you don't have peace, then, then don't. You know, I personally like lamb. And that's probably the first clue that I was born in a Greek household. I really like lamb, but there's some people that really get offended. So I won't eat it around them. I'll just wait until I get home and then eat it. <laughs> okay, so he, he tells them, you've got some people there that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Do you know that's the first thing I ever uh, read in the Bible, Kathy? The story of Balaam, Numbers chapter 22. I was not saved. Somebody said, you ought to read the Bible. And they kept telling me, you ought to read the Bible. But I didn't have a Bible. So then I moved to another house in Santa Maria up on Thornburg. And this lady knocks at my door one day, and she had one of those big white family Bibles and a little bag full of, you know, dishwashing liquid, this, that. And it's a welcome thing. So I had this big white Bible sitting on my, my uh, coffee table. I wasn't saved at all. And, uh, man, I finally put it in the closet. I just got convicted looking at it, you know. But one day I picked it up, and I, I just said, I'm going to just do this spiritual thing. I'm going to read right there. And I looked down, and it was Numbers chapter 22, and I read the whole story about Balaam. And I laughed and laughed and laughed, and I said, man, the Bible's kind of fun. Yeah. And then I read the next thing about God killing everybody. On the <laughs> well, I'll put it back in the closet. <laughs> but the story of Balaam is really an interesting story. We don't have time to read it this morning, but let me share this part with you. Balaam was a prophet of God. And this king, who saw all the Israelites move into his land, said, hey, go get the prophet of God and have him come and curse these guys. Because I've heard the story about these guys. These guys, the Israelites, these guys are like grasshoppers. They come in, they take the place over, and then everybody that's living there has to leave. Well, we don't want that because we like our property. So go get that prophet and have him come and curse them. So they sent some emissaries to him and uh, and, and they said, hey, Balaam, you know, king so-and-so wants you to come. I forget their names, but it was a king. So he said, uh, he wants you to come over here and, and curse these Israelites. And Balaam said, I can't do that. Those are people from God. I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. And they said, well, so they went back and they told the king, and they, they said, okay, well, we're going to send different messengers. And they came with promises of blessing. You come with us, Dr. Balaam. He said, I'm not a doctor. You could be. And they started tempting him. And he said, well, let me ask the Lord. So he asked the Lord, and the Lord said, no. No, you're not going. So he told him, no, I'm not going. And then they asked him some more, and he said, finally, okay. You know, and he asked the Lord again. And, and the Lord's a, a lot like the people in the Mediterranean. Now, let me explain how that works, okay? Because sometimes you read the Bible and you go, that's weird. But if you understood the Mediterranean culture, you would understand the story of Balaam. So, but I'll have to tell it to you on our level, okay? So here's my grandma, I'm in the 12th grade. And my grandpa died, so I'm living with my grandma taking care of her. And I'm, I'm a senior in high school, and I finally get a car. And uh, my friends all wanna go to the show. So I said, and you haven't heard this story before. So, <laughs> so, so I go in and I tell my grandma, yeah, yeah, I, I want to go uh, to the show tonight with my friends. She said, no, you're not going to the show and see all those filthy things that they show on, you know, that she, she had, she was very separated from the world. And I said, oh, come on, grandma, I'm in the 12th grade. I never get out of here. I feel like I'm in prison. I just want to go to the show. I want to go have fun with my friends. No. So then, wait a few minutes, go back. I want to go to the show. Go ahead, go. That's the Mideastern. When you get to that, go ahead and go. It's like Joe's lifting the one eye drop. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> go ahead and go. If I'm dead when you get back. <laughs> I'm serious, Kathy, that's what it is. And you know, because, you know, Portuguese do the same thing. If I'm dead, when you get back, just leave me in the chair. Because I'll be waiting up for you. There's a more guilt on top of that. And then just call Uncle Johnny in the morning, and he'll come and take my body to the cemetery. 
Fine. I didn't go to the show. Okay? Balaam wasn't that smart. God told him, fine, go ahead and go. That's a Middle Eastern thing. What they really mean is, you ticked me off. Now go and see what this is going to cost you. So he gets on his donkey and he starts to go with these guys, and the donkey won't go. So he gets upset with the donkey and he goes a little bit further, and the donkey smashes his leg against the wall. So he takes out his stick and he starts beating the donkey. And the donkey turns around and says, why are you beating me? <laughs> Haven't I been your donkey all these years? I've been such a good donkey for you. Now, Balaam didn't even get that his donkey was talking to him. <laughs> he starts arguing with the donkey. <laughs> There's another word for donkey, but we're not going to use it. And it's like, really? You're, you don't see that your donkey is actually talking with you? So then finally God gets his attention and an angel shows up with a drawn sword. And he figures out, oh, the donkey wouldn't go because that angel was standing there with the sword. In other words, yeah, go ahead and go. You know, it's the guilt trip thing. Don't go. So finally he goes, and the end of the story is he can't curse the children of Israel. He ends up blessing and making the king mad. But God punished him. Because he went in the, in the first place. And, and the whole point of the story is, of this church in Pergamos, you're letting these guys in here. And they're bringing all kinds of heresies and craziness, and you're just allowing it. You know, we have churches like that in modern day America mm -hmm. that are allowing all kinds of craziness to happen in their assemblies, and it's not of God. That's right. That's right. Amen. And, it, you know, I, two weeks ago I preached on that. And, and it's important that we realize we got to stick to the word of the Lord. Amen. You know, and sometimes I use stories to illustrate the point, but we got to stick to the word of the Lord. Amen. So in verse 15, he says, You also hold those people who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So I did some study on the Nicolaitans, and the Nicolaitans were very controlling, but they were also very worldly, but they they held control of the people through guilt, through putting on religious uh, falsehoods on them and stuff like that. In other words, they were controllers. And God hates that because we individually are to follow the Holy Spirit. You know, you can listen to me and I'm preaching the word, but if I go off, you don't listen to me. You listen to the Lord. You listen to the Lord. You judge what I say, Acts 17:11. Now these in Thessalonica were more, or these in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they searched the scriptures daily to see if the things Paul were saying were true. The apostle Paul's preaching to them, and they're going, "Yeah, we're going to go home and check this out in the Bible, and then we'll be back." And so they went home and opened up their scrolls. That's all they had in them days was the Old Testament. They would open up their scrolls and look and see, "Yeah, that's right. That's, that's what he said. And that's what it says." We need to test the spirits. 1 John chapter 4, and we're going to close this down here in just a minute. 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, don't believe every spirit. Had a lady come to me a couple of weeks ago and said, Oh man, I got prophesied over, praise God, and this is what's going to happen. And I knew the minute she told me what they prophesied over, that it was baloney. And it could have been bad spaghetti. I don't know. But it wasn't from the Lord. And, I, and so trying not to offend her, I said, ma'am, not anybody from this church. It was another person. And I said, ma'am, I have no doubt that a prophet spoke to you. I have no doubt. And I have no doubt that what they gave you was a prophecy. Have you ever considered that it might be a false prophet? Because what you're telling me has put you in fear and in trepidation, and now you're not sure what you're doing and you're a nervous wreck. God doesn't do that. Amen. The Bible says everything that comes from above is first peaceable, yeah. easy to be accepted, full of good fruits, without hypocrisy. All the stuff you told me is just junk. You just put the spirit of fear on you. That's a false prophet. Amen. I said, you know, if you'll let me know who it was, we'll take him out to Guadalupe and stone him to death. <laughs> yeah. I didn't tell her that. But if it was the Old Testament, that's what they'd do. A false prophet, they took him outside the city and stoned him. 
So we, we, we have to test the spirits to see if they're of God, because there are many false prophets that have gone out into the world. 1 John 4, 1, verse 2. Hereby you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that will not confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. This is that spirit of Antichrist. For if you have heard that it should come, and even now it's in the world. But you are of God, little children. You have overcome them. Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. In verse 16, he just says, repent. Now, let me show you what repent is, okay? Repent is not, gee, I'm so sorry I robbed the bank officer. <laughs> so now you go to prison. You get out and rob another bank. That's not repent. Repent is you're going one direction. You stop. Repent means Turn around and go the other way. Amen. See, before I got saved, I was going this direction in a bad way, really bad. When I got saved, I stopped, turned around, started going God's way, got rid of all the stuff. Man, I mean, I shredded like 500 pictures that I had, photographs and picture albums, and sold my Harley, sold all kinds of stuff. And it just turned around. My, my whole life turned around. Went, went to, I forget what store it was, and bought some suits and ties. Because that's the church where I was attending. You had to wear that. I turned around. And I believe that if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are continually being passed away. And new things are continually coming in. And if we don't see that, then my question is, did you repent? God says, repent. It's not a suggestion. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, if you'll turn there with me. Are you getting this, church? Amen. Amen. I pray, the Lord's really speaking to me. I pray he's speaking to you. I, I preach to me, I do. I preach and teach to me because God knows I need it. And if it'll drip off on you and you get it too, then that's double, double blessings. Isaiah chapter 11. Uh, verses 1 through 4. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch will grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. Talk about Jesus here. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the Spirit of the fear of, of, of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding and the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither will he reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the poor, and he will reprove or rebuke with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with a rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Repent. He's telling you to repent. Turn around. Stop doing that. Get those manipulations out of there. They're controlling your people. They're driving them crazy. They're, they're, they're trying to control their lives. That's, that's nobody's job in the Holy Spirit. Man, listen, if you're not going to listen to the Holy Spirit, you're not going to listen to me. So I'm not going to chase anybody around, and, you know, if you want to chase me around, that's fine. Cool. But I'm not going to chase anybody around and say, why are you living this way? Why are you doing that? Why are you doing this? It's not my job. God called me to preach the word and love the people. Amen. And, man, if, seriously, if you're not going to listen to the Holy Spirit, why would you listen to me? So in verse... Uh, 17, we're going to end this. God says, let him that has an ear, let him hear. Now, there's another teaching in there. I know it's about the little white stone. That's, that's such a cool teaching. Make sure you look into that. When we get to heaven, can you imagine the confusion? Jesus saying, hey, Joe, and 5,200 Joes turn around. <laughs> Can you, and God's not the author of confusion. So he has planned to give each one, this is a great teaching, he has planned to give each one of us a little white stone. And um, it's going to have a special name in it, just for you. And you'll be the only one, and I had a guy tell me one time, 
Oh, come on, seriously? How's he going to think of that many names? Well, I read in Isaiah chapter 40 this morning that he named every star in the universe. He can do it. We're each going to have a pet name. I don't know what it will be. You know, I'm sure some people think it'll be like Mr. Wonderful or... <laughs> But we're going to have a pet name. In history. You know, and, and uh, I think we all have pet names for different things. So God's going to give us a special name just for us on a little white stone. He's going to hand it to us. And I'm not sure if our robes have pockets or not, but we'll work it out. But that's going to have our name on it. And he, he doesn't have to say, Joe, 5,200 of them turn around or 52,000 of them. It'll just be your name, and you'll turn around, and it'll be just you and Jesus. It'll be like nobody even nobody else is even there. Just you and him. And he'll do that all at once for all of us. Because he's God. Amen. Amen. That white stone is a symbol of acquittal. I like that. In the old Greek culture, when they had like races or when you went to court, uh, in, in, in the Middle East, they did one of two things. If you got thrown in jail... They took a piece of paper and tacked it up on the door. That's your sin. And so when people went by your jail door, they could see, oh, that guy's in here for stealing. What would happen is when you got released from prison, they would put a stamp on there and, and basically it would say you're acquitted or you're forgiven. And they would fold that piece of paper up and then put it in their robe. And then when they were walking around, if someone walked up and said, hey, there's that guy that stole, he would go, I paid my price, I'm forgiven. So the little white stone is a representation of, I've been forgiven. Each one of us get one. It's going to be an amazing thing. And it'll have a special name in there. You know, I just kind of hope mine's not like boo-boo or something like that. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I know I'm already going to be in trouble for joking around. So, okay. <laughs> Cupcake. <laughs> Thank you, brother. <laughs> uh, Windex would be all right. Uh, <laughs> all right, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna uh, finish with these verses here. <laughs> oh, I hope that doesn't stick. <laughs> 1 John chapter 5, verses 4. Shouldn't you come to church and, and be blessed? Amen. Shouldn't you come to church and learn and be able to, to laugh at yourself and laugh at me? <laughs> Just have a great time in the Lord. Amen. Amen. That's what it's about. Because the world will beat you up. It'll beat you up. Uh, 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5. It says, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Are you born of God? Amen. You've overcome the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You want to overcome the world? Believe that Jesus Christ in here is the Son of God. And you will overcome. Amen. Okay? And then Psalm 62, verses 2 and 3. Psalm 62. And you know the reason I do that, so we can all turn to our Bibles. Amen? Amen. Yeah. If I had a laptop, I'd just start doing it and lose you guys fast. But I want you to learn to be able to turn to where these scriptures are. Someday you're going to need to. <coughs> you're really going to need to. The churches get more and more persecuted all the time. Psalm 62, 2 and 3. We should say in our heart what the psalmist said here. He only is my rock. I, I love you guys, and, and I believe that you love me, but I don't want to be your rock, and I don't want you to be my rock. I will let you down, and you may let me down, but Jesus will never let you down. Amen. He alone is my rock, and he is my salvation. He is my defense. I will not be greatly moved. How long would someone imagine mischief a man. David writes, you shall be slain all of you as a vine wall, shall you be as a tottering fence. 
you know, if you don't get saved, it will be like a wall that's ready to fall over. You've got to be born again. And then the last scripture, Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3.12. I like this promise. Do you like the promises of God? The Bible says all the promises of God are yes and amen in him. All the promises. This is the last verse today. Verse 12 says, He that overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. You know, pillar is, that's a pillar right there. That brick thing holding up the part of the wall. That's a pillar, 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 that's a pillar. All of you are pillars in the house of God, according to the scripture. He that overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven from my God. And here's the proof of the white stone. I will write upon him my new name. You know that song, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. The white robed angels sing the story. Let's praise God and get a new name, not cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> Would you stand with me? <laughs> God bless you, church. You know you should be happy in your life if just one comes to Christ because of you. Just one. I know there will be many more. But just one, we should rejoice. The Bible says the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner that repents, that comes to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time we've been able to spend. I've certainly had a wonderful time, Lord, just talking about you. Uh, these two churches, it's amazing that right next to each other, those two cities, and yet so different from each other. And my prayer, Lord, for us, as a body of Christ, the church, the church of God, is that we would look to you for everything, that you would only be our rock and our salvation, that you would help us to love one another and encourage one another, and even at times to provoke one another to love and to good works. Lord, you're coming soon. And Lord, you weren't making uh, doctrine when you told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Father, I'm so glad you opened my eyes to and Lord, you made it as easy as it could be for any one of us to just simply call upon your name, to turn from our wicked ways, to repent, to turn to you, and to say, dear Lord, come into my life, come into my heart. So I just thank you, Father, for your love, for your mercy, for your grace. I pray you'll bless your people as they're dismissed today. And with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I want to ask this question this morning. God knows your heart. God knows my heart. I know I'm going to heaven, not because of anything I've done. In spite of what I've done, I'm going to heaven because Jesus died for me on the cross. And I accepted his death, burial, and his resurrection. I believe that he rose, and that he shed his blood for me. Amen. And that's why I'm going to heaven, because Jesus is my rock. Amen. He's my salvation. He's my high tower. He's my shield and my buckler. If you're here today and you've not done that, I would encourage you to do that. And so as we're just in meditation and prayer here, if that's you today, if you really don't know, man, when I die, I don't know where I'm going. I'd like to go to heaven, but I honestly don't know. If that's you today, would you lift your hand just so I can pray for you? I'm just going to pray for you. God bless you. God bless you for being honest, man. God bless you. God bless you. Church, I want you to begin to pray. Just, just pray quietly for this one. Anyone else? Okay. We're not here to embarrass anyone. But we're talking about heaven and hell here. And I want you to pray that 
God would save this precious one here. I'd like you to look up, just look up at me a minute. I want to just talk to you. And everybody else is praying for you. I'm really glad you came today. And you know, I didn't I didn't know the Lord for my whole life till I was 28. I did some crazy stuff. But God showed me the truth in the Bible, and you've heard it today, that Jesus died for my sins. He was buried in the Bible says, if you'll believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, he'll come in right now. He'll come Amen. In now. Amen. I, I did that at 2 o'clock in the morning, 39 years ago. And I was shocked in the morning when I woke up that he really did come into my life. Would you like him to come into your life? I'm just going to step down here and pray with you. And the whole church is.